Okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, hello to uh, all of you who have uh, signed in. I'm very excited uh, that we're having a really terrific panel today, and uh, the topic is very topical, USA and the world. Um, no, no, we're not going to talk about the debate that just took place between the two presidential candidates uh, two days ago, uh, but we're going to talk this time about the future of arms control and uh, multilateralism, and this is the first kickoff in a series that has been organized uh, on the US and the world. Uh, we have the next one on the 15th of October. I just want to alert you to that, which is the future of transatlantic relations under a new US administration. And then on 5 November, we're going to be talking about the elections, though there were some internal discussions whether actually the result would be known by that time already. And then on the 19th of November, we have the world after the US election. So this is very much on our radar screen right now, and I know it's on yours as well. So it's very exciting that uh, we are uh, having the panel here. And uh, you know exactly, because you have been on previous occasions uh, with us and with other organizations, what has been happening in the world of arms control and disarmament, which is actually a very sad state of affairs. And we have three wonderful panelists here uh, today. And um, that is um, Mallory Stewart, who is the Director of Cooperative Monitoring Center at Sandia National Laboratories. And she's also a non-resident fellow at the Stimson Center in Washington, DC. And her area of expertise are really very widespread. It's not only chemical and biological weapons, law and uh, policy, space security policy, US missile defense, et cetera, et cetera. And she has a long career in these issues and is extremely qualified to talk to us about it. And she'll be kicking off uh, in the first session. And then the second speaker is going to be Glenn Deason, who is an associate professor at the University of Southeastern Eastern Norway and an associate editor at the Russia and Global Affairs Journal. And the last speaker is going to be Heinz Gärtner, who is the lecturer in the Department of Political Science at the University of Vienna and at Danube University. And he was the academic director of the Austrian Institute for International Affairs. And of course, he is here at the uh, International Institute for Peace, our head of the uh, uh, advisory board and uh, is very active in organizing a lot of meetings. I did not introduce myself, I apologize. I'm Angela Kane. I have a long career in the United Nations and I am now the Vice President of the IIP. And it's a great pleasure to, uh, to welcome you here. And uh, I am going to kick off a little bit by asking Mallory Stewart uh, to basically think about two issues to address. And um, the first is really that the US has been a major disruptor of the arms control structures. You have bilateral and multilateral arms control treaties were abrogated. I mean, we know about the INF, we know about the JCPOA, we know about Open Skies. And the only bilateral arms treaty between the US and the Russian Federation right now is New START. <clears throat> and we know that that is ending in February 2021, unless it is being extended by mutual agreement. And there is negotiate. there are discussions going on right now, which I'm sure you're going to be talking about. And um, the difficulties of the bilateral treaties, of course, are not limited to the Trump presidency, but rather it started already under Obama. And so it's maybe a little bit of an idea to also review what has happened before. So it's not something that all of a sudden happened out of the blue. And then I'd like to see if you could address the way forward, if there is a way forward, and what is their blueprint of a strategy that could be for the US. Also because of the increase in military funding, very high increases, not only in the US, but in other parts of the world and uh, also with a more aggressive nuclear posture review of President Trump, which has provoked uh, other uh, countries to come forward with their own. So over to you, Mallory. Thank you, uh, Angela, and to the International Institute of Peace for inviting me to speak on this panel. I'm happy to virtually be here with you, and I'm speaking in my own capacity. Um, I, I, I had, I've been asked to speak um, on the future of arms control multilateral multilateralism, but Angela, you asked some really good questions. And so I first want to address um, sort of the future of the arms control and multilateralism issue um, by discussing a general trend. And then hopefully I can get into um, addressing some of your specific questions um, as much as possible. And also I look forward to the question and answer period sort of going into more detail. Um, so there's a, a, a growing trend um, that has been 
uh, sort of developing for, for several decades and its effects are, are felt across all arenas, not just arms control and multilateralism. And this trend has been described in many ways. Most prominently, perhaps, um, is the description of this age as the post-truth era. Um, but we can hear the trend manifest itself in myriad assertions of fake news, encouragements of a culture of fear in the diminishing reliance on treaties and laws, and in the declining societal value placed on expertise and science. And all of these descriptions of this post-truth era reflect a rapid decline in trust. Um, whether it's trust in science, trust in media, trust in international alliances or organizations, trust in governments, either even trust in laws or trust in any sort of expertise has diminished. And we feel this very strongly in the US. It's not that we should blindly trust anything, of course, but the structures of international order, law, alliances, and the existence of verifiable facts is constantly being challenged. Um, this trend seems to be exacerbated by many things. Um, certainly we've seen uh, exacerbation by political actions and, and um, politicians themselves. Uh, certainly the rise of social media, allowing us to reconfirm our biases and ignore conflicting opinions, um, including um, those that may help us uh, debate our own um, convictions. Uh, but the perfected art of disinformation, even the rampant access to misinformation have exponentially furthered the erosion of trust. Um, the reason I mention this is because this trust deficit affects everything, but in the arms control arena where attribution and accountability are so crucial, uh, to upholding the rule of law and the strength of norms, it has been somewhat devastating. Um, where there is a trust deficit, um, countries by necessity abandon multilateralism and focus on national interests and objectives. And we've seen these instincts really harnessed in the US um, and we've seen the movement away from, from international order um, to a certain degree. Uh, without a basic level of trust in allies and treaty partners, international organizations or, or international structures, we naturally revert uh, to an individualistic outlook on the world. It's really in this look out for yourself environment that nationalism and arms races thrive and cooperation and collaboration fail. Um, there's numerous examples of both of these outcomes happening inside the US, um, including with respect to some of the issues that Angela referenced and, and examples of this happening internationally. And I'm happy to talk more about those examples, including personal experience with disinformation campaigns um, really disrupting the ability of the international community to hold confirmed and repeated um, attribution of CW use by a, a, a chemical weapons convention party. Um, there was really a difficulty in holding them accountable because of this rampant um, distrust for expertise and the OPCW's verification and, and attribution capacities um, and the rise of disinformation in general. But really, you've asked me to talk about the future, and I do, I do not believe it has to be gloom and doom. Um, you know, one possible path forward that has worked historically, um, you know, to, to establish a, a brighter future potentially for multilateralism and arms control is to reestablish a basic level of trust, supporting the credibility of weapons inspectors and experts, multilateral determinations of attribution and accountability, scientists and international organizations. Um, arms control and disarmament law needs to be observed and upheld with consequences for violations. And we need to encourage governments to take this path because nationalism and individualistic outlooks will be detrimental to those governments in the long run. Arms races seem to only ultimately benefit the arms industry and an isolationist attitude to the world never ultimately enhances a country's security or resilience, but, but seems to often lead to even greater insecurity and fear. Organizations with expertise need to work together to collectively understand the trust deficit um, and educate their communities about the sources for that expertise and, and enhance communication with the public and with other experts um, to build a basic level of, of trust back and, and credibility. The UN Secretary General uh, with his UN Communications Response Plan and the World Health Organization have recognized the challenges of disinformation and misinformation in the COVID-19 context. In that context, they've called it an infodemic and numerous international organizations, including UNESCO, uh, ITU, IFRC, UNICEF, and the, and the World Health Organization itself, recently signed on to a joint statement in which they commit to calling on member states to develop and implement action plans to manage 
the infodemic by promoting the timely dissemination of accurate information based on science and evidence. They, they also encourage member states to engage and listen to their communities as they develop their national action plans and to empower communities to develop solutions and resilience against myths and disinformation. We, we could adopt this approach in the arms control arena. We, we need the promotion of science-based expertise, collaborative plans to work with, engage and listen to communities to develop resilience against the forces that diminish trust and even diminish the strength of law. Um, at the Cooperative Monitoring Center at Sandia, um, that is what we're trying to do, and it's a mission to support scientific collaboration, especially between non-traditional allies, to build relationships that can withstand disinformation challenges and build trust by bringing experts together to work on collective challenges. Um, and I know so many organizations do this, right? Including the IIP, uh, by working to us together and, and establishing credibility, showing our work and our insights and even our underlying assumptions and biases, um, we can all get to a level of understanding uh, that where we can reach collective solutions, answers, and even find uh, ground truths together. Um, but, but again, we're just one of any such, any number of such organizations. Um, the Middle East Scientific Institute for Security uh, just had a really good discussion of, of its efforts in this arena. And, and really all expertise agencies and specialized organizations in the arms control arena um, could, could, could explain the basis for their actions and their expertise and, and understand the importance of their mission. Um, because we're all using science and expertise to understand why arms control is necessary uh, for the collective good and how multilateralism ultimately helps everyone more than nationalistic tendencies. Um, it's, it's not a complicated approach and undoubtedly there are many steps to addressing the decline in arms control and multilateralism, but I think rebuilding trust in expertise, especially in the, in the US context, appreciating the value of science, appreciating the value of international organizations, treaties, and, and the, the international order that's been established um, to maintain peace and security um, could go a long way to allowing uh, and, and really requiring the international, the U.S. government to work with the international community. Um, it's, it's worked in the past. We've had good examples of collaboration between the U.S. and USSR um, after the Cold War to really try to um, bridge the trust gap um, and, and really, while, while we all know the trust but verify moniker, it, there, there is an element of belief that your negotiating partners will come to the table in good faith that we need to get back to. Um, so, you know, wrap up and back to your questions, Angela, we have seen um, the U.S. pull out of significant um, pillars of the arms control arena because of this pervasive lack of trust. It's supported and promoted um, to a certain degree. Uh, by a culture that really um, has, has, has encouraged the effectiveness of disinformation, right? The rise of social media, the inability to challenge your own assumptions has allowed, um, I think, the U.S. to fall into this, this, this trust deficit. And so um, the, the, the populist idea of pulling out of treaties is more supported when we don't appreciate the value of those treaties and the need for those structures. Um, you know, I... I certainly have, have worked with Heinz and, and others in the past to talk about some of the challenges we face in, in future arms control when we have um, proposals for agreements or proposals for cooperation that plays into this trust deficit. And so I would, I would encourage us to discuss and consider how we diminish that deficit and how we try to avoid entering into further complicating or um, any sort of um, support for diminishment of expertise um, going forward. And so. Again, happy to talk about the issue specifically. I want to I want to allow uh, Glenn and Heinz to to have their interests as well. But you know, with respect to the JCPOA, with respect to the TPNW, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, I'm happy to to discuss those more specifically. Um, but I think we have to understand what the U.S. is experiencing in the context of these trends of of challenges to an underlying trust in our in our in our systems and in our um, international values and norms and really an international law. Um, so I'll stop there, but, but happy to discuss the specifics after everyone has a chance to give their intro. Thanks, Mallory. That was really terrific. And I must admit, uh, the post-truth era is really sounding
I'm rather depressing if I if I think about it, but you're absolutely right because we don't know who is the expert, who is not the expert, and who is trying to influence public opinion. And not everyone in the public is as well informed as some of the people sitting in the audience or sitting around the table here. And uh, what is really important, and you underlined that, is to rebuild the trust. And that is one of the things that I fear are being lost also in terms of the arms control treaties because there used to be regular exchanges, mill mill overflights, you know, verification, etc. And that, of course, has gone by the wayside if you abrogate treaties and they don't exist anymore. Uh, so uh, to rebuild the trust, I think, is absolutely true. And also to have scientists and to have the facts that actually establish what is happening is extremely important. Now, I'm going to turn over to Glenn. And uh, Glenn, uh, I should have mentioned, is the author of a very large number of books, on uh, Russia in particular and Russian uh, foreign policy. And uh, I uh, think you recall on the invitation that uh, the IRP sent around, there was a picture of Reagan and Gorbachev signing, which Mallory already just referred to. And, you know, this seems to be like really odd. This is like, <laughs> it's like 35 years ago now. And there have been calls also to the current uh, leaders from the US and uh, the Russian Federation to, to restate this principle, which is a very, um, which is a very important principle, but they have not agreed, or at least I believe that President Trump has not agreed to do so. So, you know, since your expertise is on Russia, it would be really important to see what is your view from Russia on multilateralism, on, uh, on arms control, and um, the, how could there be a way forward that we could, we could look, look forward to? Thank you. Glenn, to over to you. Uh, thank you. Well, I... I very much agree with uh, what Mallory Stewart uh, have been arguing. Uh, my, my perspective tends to be that a lot of this distrust is fueled by uh, the changing international distribution of power. As um, uh, the United States has been dismantling many agreements, as you mentioned, uh, under the current administration, uh, but abandonment of arms control is not a new development. Uh, it's certainly intensified in the effort of reasserting a dominant US position and uh, or making America great again. Uh, however, it's, it's not completely new. So my argument is that since the Cold War came to an end, the US and the collective West uh, was unbalanced and therefore developed institutions that aim to perpetuate uh, unipolarity. And uh, in such an environment, it's very difficult uh, to sustain arms control uh, agreements uh, because security after the Cold War uh, it's no longer been really been based on the principle of mutual constraint as it was in the bipolar era. Uh, rather, it's based on reducing constraints on the West and the US to uphold primacy and the ability to project force, but also to constrain others. Hence, this obsession with arms control through both dominance and deterrence. And we can ask, what does this really mean for arms control? Well, uh, let's address the case study of missile defense, which the U.S. and Soviet Union had pledged not to develop in 1972 in the ABM Treaty, uh, as it was recognized that missile defense could convert nuclear weapons into an offensive weapon by intercepting the retaliatory capabilities of the, of the adversary after a first strike. Now, only one month after the collapse of the Soviet Union, in January of 1992, President Bush declared in the State of the Union address that the U.S. should develop a strategic defense initiative, which is yeah, missile defense. And the month after, in February of 1992, the U.S. defense planning guidance strategy was leaked, which then was later referred to as the Wolfowitz Doctrine, which confirmed that global security would be based on U.S. dominance, which meant that no rivals should be allowed to rise and check U.S. power. Now, the key focus of the leaked uh, U.S. document was therefore, was therefore the need also to develop missile defense. And the target for this very explicitly was Russia, as the document reasoned that Russia was now the only state that uh, still remained capable of destroying the United States. So again, under this platform of security through uh, global dominance or hegemony, there's not much room for arms control and mutual constraint if the underpinning logic is that the U.S. should be able to constrain Russia, but Russia should not be allowed to constrain the United States. And we can also ask, well, what about the Europeans? Uh, as, uh, well, I guess the sole actor left to constrain uh, their ally. Uh, did they stand up for arms control? And we can also see that throughout the 1990s, 
European capitals were alarmed by the prospect of missile defense as they recognized that this could unravel arms control and their entire foundation for the nuclear detente. Um, however, uh, the Europeans also had fully signed on to the concept of security through the collective hegemony of the West, uh, again, which then translated into arms control treaty being largely influenced by dominance and deterrence. And case in point, the Europeans signed up to the idea that the new Europe should not be based on an inclusive security architecture that included Russia, which would then be designed uh, to impose voluntary constraint on all its members. Rather, the European security system has been organized around NATO, which, uh, which will then incrementally include all of Europe, except for Russia. And security has increasingly been defined by removing constraint on use of force, but also enable the West to impose constraints on Russia. So in this environment where security is based on enabling a Western hegemony rather than accepting mutual constraint, uh, the natural uh, consequence is that uh, alliance solidarity is always elevated above arms control, above international law, and uh, broader multilateralism. So indeed, we, can, we can't really even imagine anymore a hypothetical case where a dispute between a NATO member and Russia, uh, where we would take the side of the Russians, or not go against the Russians at least. And uh, here in Norway, the WikiLeaks cables can kind of demonstrated that the focus on alliance solidarity was a very much a calculated tool to overcome concerns about the collapsing uh, arms treaties. So as uh, several leaked cables uh, from the U.S. ambassador in Oslo uh, demonstrated, very much the deliberate strategy was to shift the focus from arms control to aligned solidarity. Uh, so as the ambassador argued the, in the cables very correctly was that the Norwegians would then fall in line and stop complaining about the collapsing arms agreements and the potential of nuclear arms race. So as a consequence, consequence today, we also see that uh, you're most, if not all, the European capitals have signed up to the concept of missile defense as a NATO asset. And the arguments they previously held, which Russia still expressed a concern for, are now dismissed largely as Russian propaganda. And to some extent, we can see that this is also the case with the INF Treaty. As in the U.S., there was very open discussions about the desire to abandon the INF Treaty so the U.S. could deploy new missiles to Asia to contain the Chinese. And uh, as soon as the INF Treaty was scrapped, um, this was the first thing the U.S. started to do as well, to move towards deploying missiles to East Asia. However, uh, did the Europeans then stand up uh, to the U.S. in the defense of, central, uh, of this uh, Central Arms Treaty? And we see no. Uh, Washington argued that the unilateral withdrawal of the INF Treaty was Russia's fault. And due to this primacy of alliance solidarity, uh, rather than having uh, yeah, this multilateralism, the Europeans all fell in line and largely blamed Moscow. And um, when I spoke to Sergei Kislev, the uh, yeah, former ambassador to the United States, uh, he argued that when the Russians asked the Europeans why they did not join Russia in objecting to the U.S. unilateral withdrawal, uh, Moscow was then told that Russia should not be allowed to divide the West. So again, it was so much for the treaties. And uh, keep in mind that that the purpose of arms control and multilateralism should be then to mitigate zero-sum rivalry for power and enhance security as a positive sum game. However, at the foundation, there's not really any security architecture or any institutions in Europe now that manages zero-sum rivalry in Europe. Instead, the main institutions for European security, uh, which are now NATO, NATO and the European Union, they're also largely instruments instead for uh, zero-sum competition. Uh, as this institution merely pushed the dividing lines to the east. And uh, there's not really any institutions now to manage uh, the power arrangements that uh, arms treaties need to survive. And again, irrespective of the benign intentions for this uh, post-Cold War security architecture in Europe, we must recognize in the West that we have now become the revisionist power by reorganizing Europe. And often this, this will unavoidably have consequences. So, for example, when NATO began to expand, uh, the conventional forces of Europe, uh, the CFE Treaty, uh, collapsed. And also the founding act of 1997 now pretty much means uh, nothing as uh, military bases are being opened from you know, Poland, Romania. And you might even have the possible, the possible uh, prospect of a you know, future stationing of nuclear weapons in Eastern Europe, which uh, well, doesn't seem that far-fetched anymore. 
And of course, next in line is this collapse now we see of the Star Treaty. Not yet, but very soon it would appear, uh, which the U.S. has been reluctant to extend. Uh, and the argument, though, the, the U.S. demands that this new agreement must include China. And I would argue that that's a very reasonable um, request to make, as uh, the bipolarity is over and the realities, new realities have definitely developed. Uh, however, the U.S. then demands that Russia pressures China. Uh, to join in on this treaty, which is largely a non-starter, as that would poison Russian-Chinese relations and then marginalize Russia even more. Uh, because after this continuous NATO expansionism and now six years of anti-Russian sanctions, the attempt, uh, well, the, uh, Russia's view of China, uh, China is now seen to largely become an indispensable ally and partner for Russia, because Russia now depends on China for security, uh, for political solidarity, and also to diversify its economy away from this excessive reliance on the West. So China is now partnering with Russia for technological modernization, uh, developing strategic industries, building new transportation corridors outside U.S. control, and new development banks to de-dollarize and trade in regional currencies, new payment system, etc., etc. So in short, Russia is in no position to put any pressure on China at all. And meanwhile, you know, the Russians can still read American policy papers where they pop up often stating the ambition of dividing Russia and China so the U.S. can remain dominant. So I argue that this new Eurasian economic uh, reorientation of Russia to shield it from Western sanctions also mean that Moscow will not be very willing in the future to put much pressure on Iran either if this will undermine the, the relationship with Tehran. Uh, in any future uh, arms control agreements. And I would also add that a new Russian nuclear doctrine of June 2020 has scrapped all references uh, for nuclear weapons threats from Asia as well as the Middle East. So this is very new now, and Russia now solely considers uh, nuclear weapons threats to derive only from the West. So, uh, so the strategy of having more and more weapons closer and closer to Russian borders in order to you know, both have dominance and deter Russia is very much collapsing the arms treaties and is making it very impossible also to ask the Russians for help to pressure its eastern partners to join in on this, uh, on, on expanding the treaties, even though obviously I would agree that there is a necessity behind it. So yeah, so that would be my conclusion to wrap up. I think in a unipolar security architecture that marginalizes Russia and imposes arms control through dominance and deterrence rather than accepting mutual constraints, it's very difficult to preserve arms control agreements from the bipolar era. There's also very little opportunity to transition to multipolar arms treaty, and there's also no chance of crafting new arms agreements uh, to manage the new weapons technologies that will likely be rolled out uh, faster and faster in the year to come. So I think that to revive arms control and multilateralism, we really need to consider the wider context of how international security is organized. And uh, yeah, I'll pass it on to Heinz. Thank you very much, Glenn. This was a very comprehensive overview. And of course, what you talked about, the changing distribution of power is really at the basis of all of the recent developments. And yes, they've been a while in coming, but I think that uh, in the last couple of years, it's really accelerated to a tremendous extent. Also, where the realization has been setting in as to what's been happening in the world. I mean, sometimes these shifts are very subtle and they occur over a number of years and all of a sudden, boom, it hits you as to what is happening. But I want to come back to some other things. But before we do, let me just say to the uh, participants who are with us, uh, if you have a question or a comment, then I would uh, encourage you before I turn over to our last speaker, Heinz Gärtner, to put it in the Q&A function. And if you have problems with the Q&A function, you can also do it in the chat function. Uh, so uh, that would be very helpful for, for us to monitor it a bit and then to see what are your concerns that uh, we can possibly address and uh, we can uh, respond to. Now, Heinz uh, Gärtner, of course, is a, uh, a very experienced academic and he's lived in the United States. So he straddles both worlds, both the US and also uh, Europe. And he's also written a number of books on that. And um, the, uh, the, you know, the, the question is now, of course, we've seen Russia, we've seen the US, and how does it look from your viewpoint in terms of uh, multilateral, uh, multilateralism and, uh, and arms control? Please, Heinz. 
Um, thank you, Angela. Thank you for the introduction. Um, also, thank you for chairing this uh, meeting. Uh, you're a well-known expert on multilateralism as well as on uh, um, arms control. So I'm particularly grateful that you're doing this, but also Mallory and Glenn, uh, I want to thank you that you uh, agreed to participate here as uh, panelists. Uh, I'm afraid I will paint a more gloomy uh, picture uh, than um, Mallory. Uh, I will talk about uh, arms control, multilateralism in a global uh, context. And um, starting with some uh, general remarks, then I will uh, talk about three case studies and also what has, has been already mentioned, the INF Treaty, the GCPOA, and uh, then on the Non-Proliferation Treaty in the context of the uh, Ban Treaty, the Treaty on the Prohibition of uh, Nuclear Weapons. So in general, we can we see now uh, three global trends we are talking about. So that's a decline of multilateralism, uh, a crisis of arms control, not to talk about uh, disarmament, and an increasing polarization uh, in the world. Um, so what do we have here in this context? And we have we are moving towards a multipolar world is uh, increased simultaneously with its uh, increasing uh, arms race and less multilateralism, less uh, arms control. This reminds me a little bit on the, if you have all analogy, analogies uh, somehow uh, might fail at some point, uh, however, that reminds me on the um, end of the 19th century when the Vienna Congress was uh, starting to collapse and uh, we had an increased uh, tension uh, between the war, later war fighting uh, parties and then intensified uh, security uh, dilemma. So multilateralism and uh, arms control, it has been mentioned already, um, many multilateral arms control agreements are in danger, uh, uh, already uh, abrogated, uh, mainly because the US withdrew uh, from the GCPOA uh, and uh, also the Open Skies Treaty, not mentioned has been the Arms Trade Treaty, uh, and also the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty is in danger because there was some announcement that nuclear test, testing might be uh, resumed, uh, and also the Missile Technology Control Regime the, uh, will be adapted, undermined, because now it should uh, be allowed also to export uh, 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 drones. Uh, but the crisis of multilateralism goes, of course, ways beyond uh, arms control. We have the attacks on the World Health Organization, World Trade Organization, uh, the International uh, Criminal uh, um, Court of Justice, and UNESCO, and the uh, defunding of, uh, of peacekeeping. Bilateral arms, Angela mentioned this already, bilateral arms control uh, uh, is um, in crisis as well. Um, it started not with Trump, the Trump administration, of course, so we can go back to the uh, um, abandoning of the ABM treaty. And Glenn talked a lot about missile defense uh, in 2000, uh, 2003, but now uh, the INF treaty has been abrogated. And I agree the uh, New START treaty uh, is uh, in danger. It might not be uh, extended beyond uh, 2021, but I, I will come uh, back to this uh, a, little, a little later. Uh, so we have this uh, increased, um, less multilateralism, is increased uh, polarization, and uh, now we are moving towards great power competition. And the national security strategy of the US mentions 2018 mentions that, that the world is moving towards great uh, power uh, competition and we see already the deteriorating of the US uh, China uh, relations and just a report uh, released yesterday by the uh, House um, of Armed Services Committee said uh, China is the main uh, threat um, economic threat and threat to uh, national security, but the most immediate threat is uh, Russia because of its nuclear 
uh, as an uh, I said I, I will paint a gloomy pitch, picture, but the academic Graham Ellison uh, developed this idea of the tequila trap, uh, which means if you have a hegemonic power and a rising power in history, it's uh, almost certain that it will, might come to a great power uh, war. Not necessarily, but it's uh, very likely. But Graham Ellison looked at historical cases, but now we have the situation uh, a world in with great power competition and with uh, nuclear weapons, uh, what means polar, a polarizing world uh, and uncontrolled uh, nuclear deterrence. And uh, of course, there's, there are lots of definitions of nuclear deterrence, uh, but uh, it means basically inflicting uh, maximum uh, danger on the advisory. So my three examples are first, uh, I'm, to talk about the uh, INF Treaty. Uh, now, since it has been abandoned, uh, Russia and the United States have all options uh, to deploy uh, medium range uh, territory based uh, ballistic uh, missiles in Europe uh, and uh, in Asia if they intend to do so. Uh, this is a deja vu. I'm old enough because I lived through this already, a DJV of the, of the 80s. In the 80s, before the, we had the uh, INF Treaty, there was the, the Europeans all of a sudden discovered there might be uh, a limited nuclear war on uh, European uh, territory because of this, the deployment of the Persian cruise missiles and the uh, Soviet uh, SS, SS-20. Now, as Glenn mentioned, of course, China is one of the main reasons why this treaty has been uh, abandoned, um, because China was not covered by this treaty. Uh, but the idea that uh, China might be included in future agreement on uh, nu uh, immediate uh, range nuclear weapons is a non-starter, because China's uh, missile arsenal, 80% of those are territory-based uh, medium-range uh, missiles. So for China, there is no reason to talk about uh, an, 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 a treaty which includes uh, China, China as well. Um, after all, Russia and uh, the United States might deploy their missiles anyway uh, because of power projection and also because of uh, North Korea. Uh, but this trend towards, uh, uh, the, the trends of, uh, which is demonstrated by the abrogation of the INF Treaty shows a larger development. And the, the development means that we are moving towards uh, smaller nuclear weapons. Smaller nuclear weapons is uh, low yield. The nuclear posture review mentioned by uh, Mallory uh, already talks about this uh, low yield uh, nuclear weapons and also the strategy. I know, Glenn, that's not an official Russian expression, but the Pentagon is using it. Uh, uh, what the Russians uh, define the Russian strategy is escalation to escalate to de escalate. It's about the same thing, starting with small, uh, war with no, smaller nuclear weapons and moving on then several stages, uh, hoping that it will de-escalate at some point. So but both sides, uh, Russia and the United States, want to keep the escalation control on every of these uh, stages. Uh, and also they want to keep the escalation dominance, which means uh, that to have the possibility of the last strike. So smaller make, uh, weapons make it more likely to use them first and more tempting, uh, but they also want to have the last strike. So that's why I think the new START treaty might not be extended because for the last strike, strike you need intercontinental uh, ballistic missiles and then you have to have some uh, uh, flexibility. Um, second uh, example is the GCPOA. The GCPOA, to my mind, it was the best negotiated uh, arms control uh, agreement uh, in history with a very comprehensive verification uh, system, 160, 164 uh, pages. 
and it would have brought nuclear stability uh, to the uh, to the Gulf region. Uh, now, because of this, uh, because the U U.S. left it, the maximum pressure, uh, it might might be the danger that uh, Iran might resume its nuclear program again. It's already uh, reducing its uh, commitments. And there are already some illusions that eventually it might leave the MPT uh, uh, altogether. Uh, what then happened, it happens is Saudi Arabia has already announced if Iran goes nuclear, Saudi Arabia will go, will go nuclear uh, uh, as well. So the idea of a nuclear weapon free zone Middle East is farther away. So far, Israel has been the most uh, stumbling, the, the biggest stumbling block to implement. Uh, this nuclear weapon free zone, but it now, go, now goes a ways uh, beyond, uh, beyond uh, Israel already. Uh, the GCP would have had the potential uh, to prevent this. So, the last point, uh, the last example, I go to the NPT uh, itself. And uh, of course, the nuclear weapon free zone Middle East always have been a stumbling block of the uh, review conferences of the MPT. So the uh, MPT conference now has been uh, postponed because of uh, COVID, uh, but I'm sure the nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East will be another uh, issue in, 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 the, in the conference. But another issue is of course, that the non-nuclear weapon states uh, are complaining for decades now uh, that the nuclear weapon states do not meet the commitments under Article 6 of the of the treaty. That means negotiating good faith uh, for uh, towards uh, complete uh, disarmament. So the non-nuclear weapon states uh, feel betrayed. They have sacrificed something. So not develop going nuclear, not developing nuclear uh, weapons, but they didn't get much in return. So that that's that discovered this uh, legal gap. The legal gap and this legal gap should be closed by the treaty on the prohibition of uh, nuclear weapons. Now, I guess only four ratifications are, uh, are pending. And uh, this uh, treaty calls for full implementation of Article 6 of the NPT and complete uh, disarmament. Um, so, to sum up, uh, last uh, sentence is uh, we, are, we are moving towards a polarizing world with an uncontrolled uh, nuclear deterrence. Uh, we have two norm systems. Mallory was talking about uh, norm systems. But now with two more norm systems uh, emerging. Uh, for those states who feel more secure with nuclear weapons than nuclear weapon states, and those states who feel more secure without nuclear weapons. After all, the non-nuclear weapon states are arguing uh, also the nuclear weapon states should be more, uh, should feel more secure without nuclear weapons. And they would be the first target of a nuclear weapons exchange uh, uh, after all. Uh, so my argument uh, would be if we want to prevent and avoid the catastrophic humanitarian consequences that Ben Treaty is talking about, uh, eventually, the only solution would be to uh, get rid of the abolish nuclear weapons altogether. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Heinz. Uh, we've heard really three wonderful and very uh, excellent presentations from the three of you. So I'm very happy to have also very different views. But uh, what really comes through is also the uh, geopolitical changes that have occurred. With China, it's sometimes said it's a rising power or it's already a power that's already risen and is equal to the United States and the Russian Federation. But on the other end, it's a reality that we have to basically contend with. And um, I uh, must say that um, when you talk about trust, I'm very much reminded uh, of Reagan, who always sort of said, trust but verify. And uh, people forget this sometimes that, you know, you cannot trust because it has to be based on something. And the basis really has to be the verification or it has to be facts. And unfortunately in our world that is extremely difficult. Now, I like the fact also that Heinz mentioned the two norms. And the two norms is, is something that is really shaping up even though the nuclear 
uh, weapon states are denying the fact that there is a norm that could include not having nuclear weapons at all. So they have not been very welcoming to the uh, Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Uh, but it is a norm and it will come into effect. And I think it's probably going to come into effect even before we have the NPT review conference, whether it takes place in January or whether it takes place later, I really don't know. Uh, one of the uh, questions that I have, and it also goes to Glenn, because Glenn, what you haven't talked about, and maybe this is also worth mentioning, I think it's very, very difficult for, for the West. And I appreciate particularly your making the bridge with China and Russian Federation and kind of the mutual dependency, if I can even call it that. Um, but uh, what I find interesting is that, for example, Russia has done its level best to really um, confront the, the Western Europe and the Western powers with everything that's happened, whether it's Crimea, whether it's uh, Ukraine, whether it's um, uh, the poisoning in the UK, the Skripal, and now with Navalny, that makes it very, very difficult to actually build trust, because how do you start building trust on that basis? And um, the other question that I have to you, and maybe that would also to the three of you to open it up, how can you actually move forward with building trust in a world that is right now dominated by a pandemic? because we don't even know. I think every one of us six months ago thought this was gonna be over by the summer. And now we are looking at a world where this is still going to continue for maybe another year. We, don't, we just don't know. It's totally, it's totally uh, unknown as to how long we're gonna be live with that. And that limits all of the contacts that we would normally have in order to build trust in an interpersonal re uh, relationship that we're building up. I don't know if any of you, and I would like to then open it up for questions because they're coming in already, but that was one of the things that um, I uh, wanted to raise with you. Building trust, not something that has not happened. And China is in a similar situation. I mean, they're not have exactly built trust with the West either for various reasons, whether it's the um, uh, IT, it's the hacking, you know, also for, for Russian Federation. So there are a lot of issues there that also need to be taken into account. How do you deal with that? Does anyone want to volunteer or shall I uh, call on someone? No one volunteers. Mallory, I'm gonna start with you. Yeah, um, you know, I think you had a lot of good points there. Um, I, I did like, I, I actually thought Glenn was gonna jump in on your first question, but I, I like your question about, um, trust building in this context, right? We could look to the UN communication strategy of encouraging everyone to try to challenge this infodemic, as they call it, um, fighting against the sources of bad information and trying to explain where expertise and scientific, scientific um, agreement can come from, right? And I also want to get to one point I saw in the question and answer, because there is a, there, in, the, in the chat box, sorry, there was a question on that did trust ever exist? Is it is it foolish to suggest that we're trying to get back to a trust state when when trust never exists in the first place? And you know, I would argue it's a trust but verify, right? It there is trust, and you need verification processes that you mutually developed to confirm and be confident in that level of cooperation. And I think you know, I I worked extensively with the OPCW when I was in government, and it used to be a consensus-based environment. The Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons at the Executive Council made its agreements by consensus. Everyone agreed they were working toward the same goal and the ambassadors generally came to agreement in that organization through a consensus approach, understanding the basis of information and understanding challenges that needed to be overcome. Fortunately, um, you know, there were obviously disagreements, but most recently there hasn't been any consensus because in the Syria context, um, there has been a divide of uh, trust for the institutional expertise in the OPCW, the fact that the verification capacity and the attribution capacity of these trained scientists has been challenged by those that don't like um, the, the evidence they're putting forward. And I think when I say we need to get back to trust and to a level of trust, it's not claiming that we are just going to blindly trust each other. It's based on understanding where the information comes from and trying to be honest about, of course, personal perspective, personal bias. But when the OPCW goes forward and says we have evidence of helicopters dropping chemical weapons as an established pattern since uh, before Syria joined the chemical weapons, um, but really continuing after um, they joined the chemical weapons convention, and we need to hold them accountable in some way. And the fighting of that um, finding 
uh, by Russia and others, um, claiming that there's no expertise in the OPCW to make those determinations, really challenges that institution as, as a repository of scientific expertise and, and, and a trust-based operation. And so, um, you know, in this environment, you asked how we can get back to trust. I do think that activities where um, the organizations involved uh, can publish the, the, the information they're relying on, where you can have these Zoom conversations and you can say, this is what I'm looking to. Even having a Zoom strategic stability dialogue between the US and Russia or between the US and, and any sort of um, uh, external entities that are concerned about behavior to communicate why our concerns exist. And if it's over Zoom, it's over Zoom, but to communicate why we have concerns, to try to understand what we can do to overcome those concerns. Um, one thing I should point to with respect to the INF, there's very different narratives. And with respect to all of the West versus Russia or West versus China, there's just very different narratives, right? In, in, in my experience in the US, my understanding was we pulled out of the INF because we repeatedly, this is again, from an outside perspective, I was not in government at that point, um, we pulled out because we had repeatedly told Russia we didn't think they were complying and there was an insufficient evidence that made us feel confident that they were complying. That's the narrative. Now, I'm not saying that there weren't obviously um, uh, sort of uh, reasons outside of that and that maybe the U.S. government was concerned about China and others developing um, potential uh, missile capacity um, and, and INF relevant capacities. But it's these narratives that we need to get on the table and understand how collectively, uh, with expertise and scientific support, we can get to a comfort level of, of again, a level of trust, right? With, with, with um, Russia coming forward and showing that they weren't violating a treaty potentially to a level that we would be satisfied with. Unless there's no level and it's just a geopolitical struggle and a, and a, and a, a, political, a political maneuver, in which case that should be exposed as well, if possible. We can say, no, we won't trust you no matter what you say. And then we can see the U.S. for taking that position um, you know, for what it's worth. I think coming forward and demonstrating positions, what we're relying on um, to have those positions, and I do think uh, we've seen some unique examples in the recent history of the U.S. exposing more intel reliance than they ever have, right? You had after the um, the August 21st, 2013 Syrian chemical weapons attack, you had the, for the first time the U.S. White House put on its website. It's, it's um, very quickly derived intelligence and understanding as to why they assumed this was, why they understood this to be the Syrian government. I think going forward and trying to show the basis for your beliefs. And they, those can be wrong, but at least having an understanding between the participants as to what you're relying on and, and then understanding what they're relying on talking about it. Um, and one last point, though I know I've been talking too long, is that with respect to um, Russia's involvement in, in you know, the, the power of, of the, the, the push towards arm control, control, control through dominance and deterrence, um, I, I am fascinated by you know, the recent evidence that there's a support for the Trump administration by the Russian government, right? It's an interesting give and take on this where they disagree with some of the actions that this administration has taken, and yet there's uh, a lot of support for this administration within um, the, it sounds like, coming from the Russian government. And so, you know, I think there is an understanding that dis, um sort of encouraging the U.S. to go forward in dismantling arms control and diminishing multilateralism actually supports um, those governments that need to enhance their own um, uh, allies and connectivity, right? Um, Glenn had mentioned Russia is turning to China in the, for the first time in some time as a new ally, a new support network. And I think as the U.S. diminishes in, in its multilateralism and arms control support, uh, we'll see Russia and China and others um, grow stronger. Thank you very much, Mallory. And also, I appreciate the fact that you brought in the Syrian question, which, of course, is a very important one, which I personally have spent a lot of time on as well. And there you had a very unusual coherence all of a sudden between Russia and the United States when, you know, Russia forced Syria to accede to the uh, uh, Chemical Weapons Convention. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's really very interesting when you look at what is happening, and I'm going to turn to Glenn, I'm going to ask you that question to follow up on, on what uh, Mallory has said, but particularly because Russia has consistently stated that it wanted these treaties to continue, these bilateral treaties to continue with the United States. 
And then the question is like, why did they want to do that? Why did they want to extend it? And the other question that was one of the questions that also came in through the uh, through the uh, uh, chat functions is like, uh, uh, Foreign Minister Zarif has also said that Iran, JCPOA, would like to to basically continue the JCP, would like the US to go. So the, the question is, does that mean there's an admission of weakness on their part to uh, to want to continue that? I mean, does that give the impression to the United States they can get a quote, a better deal in the negotiations? Uh, what does that mean, particularly also with Russia? And maybe uh, Heinz can come later back also to, to Iran because I know that you have tremendous expertise on that subject. Glenn, please. Uh, thanks. Okay, I'll, yeah, I'll start with the trust issue and then move on to why Russia would extend it. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, well, the, the trust issue, much like I discussed before, I think is very much uh, rooted in, uh, in in the security ar architecture or the absence of it, uh, because um, uh, often this uh, exclusion of, of Russia, the, the, the logic gets kind of twisted. That is, uh, a security architecture and shared institutions would give Russia an, an institutional voice to defend its interests, a soft, soft power, if you want, and thereby impose constraints on the West instead of relying on hard power. However, the logic after the Cold War has been that uh, depriving Russia of institutional representation and influence uh, would simply result in cancelling Russian influence in Europe, and it would be unable to check the West and essentially just uh, leave off into Asia as we can march east. Now, and this is very much always reflected in the rhetoric that you know, NATO is the main institution of Europe and Russia should have no veto. However, what does that mean if you take away the institutional uh, ability to constrain the West? Well, then Russia only rela relies on hard power to constrain the West. And um, uh, so I would argue that, uh, uh, that these institutions now uh, we have to ask, are this is an arch, uh, security architecture and shared institution, are they meant to mitigate these zero-sum conflicts which we have between us and Russia, or are these institutions merely uh, a carrot to give Russia limited voice if they fall in line and do not check us? And I think uh, part of this uh, idea that we don't have trust in Russia because the way it behaves, I would argue that uh, the way Russia behaves is, is largely that of a balancing power. And uh, so I would argue that Russia is very much in the military terms, a status quo power. And uh, so we see, you know, three times Russia's used military force now after the Cold War. And, uh, you know, so in Georgia, uh, well, what did Russia do? Well, they used the military force after a U.S. funded and trained Georgian army tried to take South Ossetia by force. Now, uh, as opposed to what many expected, they didn't invade Tbilisi. They simply took back and held the position they already had in South Ossetia. Uh, this doesn't conform with international law, but it's still remaining, holding on to the status quo. And it's the same in Ukraine. Uh, they, they saw the top link of Yanukovych. They knew what was down the road. Uh, you know, Russia would be pushed out of Sevastopol, and down, down the line, they would be replaced by NATO. And unlike what many commentators expected, they didn't inv invade Kiev. They, they held on to the position they already had, and now they secured their base in Crimea. And the same goes with Syria. Uh, uh, Keep in mind, the, the revision is changing the structure in the region would be uh, the Western powers, which have been trying to topple Assad, uh, which would have great uh, geostrategic implications for the region. Russia moved in to prevent, uh, prevent uh, the removal of power, prevent the regime change. So well, one can disagree, one can talk about you know, morality, international law, but at the heart of it, this is the actions of a status quo power, one that does not have, cannot rely on the on international institutions or a security architecture to defend its interests and uphold the rules. Rather, it's down to uh, hard power as the last line of defense, as it does not have any security ar architecture to lean on. And I think that's very much where the trust has to come from as well, uh, security architecture. And um, I would also add that that's also why uh, Russia would be very happy to extend, and Russia already said that they would be happy to extend the START Treaty without any preconditions at all. And part of the reason is Russia is largely a status quo power in its military relations with the West. Uh, if people would look to revisionism, I, was, I would look more to the economic in, uh, architecture, which Russia is attempting uh, to change together with China. But in the military sphere, I simply uh, see Russia responding as a status quo power and the trust largely being absent due to this uh, absence of any uh, security architecture or any reliable institutions where it can uh, check the West. So 
uh, yeah, that's my position. Thank you very much, Glenn. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I uh, uh, must admit, I mean, the status quo power, I mean, that's uh, an interesting uh, term to use in this case, but I, I, I agree with you. And I also think that the trust was eroded in many ways because there were certain guarantees given by guarantees, promises made by NATO after the fall of the, so of the Soviet Union that the westward, the eastward expansion would not, would not actually extend as far as it has now. And so now you have 30 member states uh, primarily those added from West Eastern Europe who have uh, been in NATO. So I think that's another issue. And I remember there was always this talk about the near abroad <clears throat> with the then Soviet Union and then shortly after they became the Russian Federation and the rest of the Soviet Union fell away. So that is something that is clearly not very much appreciated in the, in the West. But I'm going to um, turn it over to Heinz and I'm going to link it also, Heinz, if you don't mind, to a question that came in in the chat and um, that is, um, uh, again, with, uh, with uh, Iran, uh, what is the possibility to have the uh, US uh, rejoin if the president changes? I think Biden has already indicated that he would rejoin, but also considering the agreements between the UAE and Bahrain uh, and Egypt as a possibility, I mean, is it possible that there could be a nuclear weapon-free zone in the, in the Middle East? Is that a possibility? Can I turn over to you, uh, please, Heinz? Thank you. Um, first to the uh, trust issue uh, uh, as well. Uh, of course, I painted a very gloomy picture but and uh, made reference to the late 19th century. But when uh, Mallory talked about trust, I was thinking about other analogies as well, which are not that gloomy. Uh, and uh, so I was um, uh, thinking about um, at the height of the Cold War, we had the Helsinki uh, Agreement in uh, 75. So, and when, if you look at today's security strategies all over, they are full of expressions like threats, adversaries, rivals, uh, competitors. If you go back to the Helsinki Final Act, there is not such a word. There is not, nothing, no, no reference to enemy threat or anything else. Uh, lots of cooperative security, uh, common uh, common security, confidence building, so I'm not calling it uh, trust build, but it's basically more or less uh, the same, uh, confidence building. And uh, also they uh, defined uh, areas of cooperation at that time already. And um, they had three baskets and all uh, already agreed on some, on some common uh, values as well. So like humanitarian uh, issues, uh, but economic cooperation, uh, but also other issues which are very relevant today. And uh, Angela mentioned, mentioned this in the times of COVID. Uh, cooperation in science, uh, health, not only security, but also all the it is, uh, other issues. So uh, Helsinki might be a model we want to look at in today's conflict. Of course, if you talk to NATO officials, they would say the best we can achieve is the Hamel Plan 67. So that means strong deterrence with dialogue. So we are not even at 67 now, but we should try to move on to 75. 75 uh, would be much better situation, global situation, where we have built trust and confidence, uh, like uh, Mallory, Mallory mentioned. Of course, there's some very specific steps you could do today. And uh, I just, it's not just what, what I'm saying, but I just read the book um, by this book by uh, Bill Berry and, uh, and, and uh, Colina. Uh, they have some very specific uh, uh, suggestions like stop launch and warning, uh, uh, no first use, uh, limit missile defense, uh, extend start. Of course, these are very limited uh, suggestions because, because uh, after all, they would support still nuclear weapons and the second strike capability. So moving to the second strike capability, that doesn't mean that you really can uh, abolish nuclear weapons, what the PEM Treaty uh, would, uh, uh, would ask for. But still, steps for confidence building, for trust building, as uh, Mallory mentioned, there are examples in, in, in in history, that's what I, I just wanted to, to mention. And then the next uh, thing is, uh, of course, uh, uh, the, the two questions 
uh, about um, uh, Iran. Um, in contrast to mainstream media, there is a strong uh, opposition against the GCPA, not only in the US, but also in Iran itself. And uh, if uh, like the US administration continues with maximum pressure, uh, that Iran might come to the point and say, okay, we don't want the GCPOA, either because we cannot negotiate with these Americans uh, anyway, so you can't, you can't uh, trust them because they already abandoned the, uh, the agreement we, we, we negotiated and put sanctions on the uh, Europeans and European companies, which would abide by agreement and negotiate it uh, themselves. So why should we do this uh, with, the, uh, with the Americans again? So there is a danger if you move uh, along this line uh, that we have really a, a really destabilized situation in the, in the Middle East. There is some hope if the Biden administration comes in and uh, uh, will uh, go back to the GCPOA. Uh, the Iranians will not open up the GCPOA. So that's not going to happen. All the other issues like regional issues and missile, missile issues they might have uh, to be addressed elsewhere, not in the GCPA. So, of course, Iran should go back to its commitments of the GCPA as well, if Biden uh, wants to pick up on the GCPA and go back to the GCPA as well. Uh, missiles is a major issue for the US, if so, it's no danger for the US and not even for the Europeans, but the Iranians would, could uh, hit. Uh, Europe or the US with uh, nuclear weapons. Nevertheless, it's an, an issue, but this one should be addressed uh, on a regional level. So regional arms control, which includes not, uh, uh, other regional actors, it doesn't single out Iran. Of course, we have, you have to include Saudi Arabia, maybe in a later stage Israel uh, as well. And um, the Iranians, made such, uh, Foreign Minister Sarif made the suggestion of regional uh, dialogues that could could have been done well be done in this in this framework. Uh, now, of course, we have these um, agreements Israel with uh, some Arab uh, states. Uh, so uh, somehow, I guess Iran has to consider something to be part of the regional dialogue uh, against themselves. So a very bold suggestion from my side, and the Iranians might not want to hear this. What I'm saying. The Iranians should also think to uh, make um, to uh, to uh, have diplomatic relations with Israel if Israel uh, recognizes the border of 67. So that might be a possibility that Iran come back in in this regional dialogue and does not exclude uh, it, it does not exclude uh, Israel. Uh, Another point of the nuclear weapon free zone, Middle East, it doesn't go off the ground for since the 70s. So Egypt made the suggestion in the 70s already, and they always uh, Angela knows this much, much better than I do. In all the review conferences, is, uh, Israel and the US would uh, 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 veto this or oppose this. You know? So uh, there is something what Iran could do as a confidence building measure, two things what Iran could do as a confidence building measure. First of all, it should sign and ratify the Penn Treaty. So it voted for it in uh, 2017 in New York. And there is no reason why Iran should not ratify and sign it if it does not want to develop nuclear weapons as Iran is saying. So that would be uh, one suggestion. The second confidence building measure Iran could do in order to assure that it will not develop nuclear weapons if the nuclear weapon free zone released uh, is a non-go, non-starter non right now, Iran could join the nuclear weapon free zone uh, Central Asia. Yeah, Iran has very good historical, cultural uh, relations, language relations with uh, countries in Central Asia. So if the US uh, guarantees, uh, have, uh, guarantees these negative security assurances, that uh, all states in this nuclear weapon free zone will not be attacked by a nuclear uh, weapon state. So another confidence building measure is that the US could convince Saudi Arabia to join Belindaba, the North African nuclear weapon free zone. 
had Egypt signed it already, and but didn't ratify it. So it would seem leave Israel as the only nuclear weapon power in the Middle East, but it would be a step closer to the Middle East uh, nuclear weapon free zone. And at some point, Israel will have to discuss its nuclear weapons uh, as well. So Iran could do a lot itself. Even so, I have to say the max maximum pressure uh, of the US is uh, actually a really a dangerous thing to do and might push Iran in the direction of uh, maybe even go back to uh, the situation before the GCPA has been adopted 2012-13 when it was very close to the nuclear weapon uh, already. Thank you very much, Heinz. Yeah, you are making some uh, very provocative suggestions here. I hope that everyone is listening well. Uh, very interesting ideas. And I'm going to have one last question, and I don't expect that all of you need to answer this because we have so many questions that I'd all like to get to. And it's still about trust. And the question is really that, you know, we're talking for so many years already about rebuilding trust, but was there in fact trust at one time? I mean, after all, many of these agreements were really negotiated in the midst of the Cold War when the mistrust was extremely high. And um, the, uh, the allegations about non-compliance and the suspicions I think we're always there. And so the question I asked, I mean, should it be not better to be more pragmatic and to convince the stakeholders that everyone gains from the agreements and therefore any agreement is better than none. Uh, also, there are different value backgrounds and so rationality rather than trust uh, because it's easier to withdraw from an agreement but very difficult to, uh, to get a new one. And could the EU possibly serve as a mediator. So I'm going to open this to either of the three panelists who wish to pick it up. I, I, I'm happy to take a stab unless, oh, Glenn, please I thought you were going to lean in. Go for it. <laughs> please, please, Nalari. Thank you. I mean, I, I think, you know, there is a way to get back to trust that we established after the Cold War, but it was through uh, joint inspections, it was through verification procedures, right? If you collectively decide what you need to reach that level of trust, you can you can aspire in that direction and you can hopefully show each other enough to get there. Unless, you know, you actively decide not to have trust because of other reasons. You're not you're not in good faith engaging in that trust building exercise. And I think there is a challenge there as to whether um, you know, countries will want to enter into agreements if that agreement is not in their in their in their mind something that they see in their interest. But I think to the to the point of whether we can get back to a level of trust in the height of the Cold War, we certainly had this trust but verify mentality. But we were able to get to that verification because we said, okay, let me show you what you need to see. Let's come together and figure out what we need to do collectively. It's the concept of you know scientific engagement, this concept of expertise sitting around the table saying, this is what I need to feel safe, to feel trust. And we can build that. Um, but I would add to the question, the concern of the enforcement of law, right? I would add that if you are, I'm, I'm a huge fan of treaties. I started my career at the State Department as a treaty lawyer. I think, you know, treaty and treaties and multilateralism is, is, is really uh, important. But I think if you have treaties in force, such as the Chemical Weapons Convention, and you don't enforce them despite multiple indications of violation, then the entire treaty structure of international law is diminished because people see these as no more than political statements of support that result in nothing when violations happen. So I agree we need to move back towards um, uh, bilateral and multilateral engagement to, to get to greater verification and greater trust building exercises. CBMs, of course, uh, that it's, you know, arms control is all about these confidence building measures. But if you have international law and arms control treaties on the book, you need to actually enforce them when there are violations or have some consequences when they're violated. Um, and, you know, to the burgeoning treaties going forward, I'll say something rather controversial. I think, you know, the, the, background and the impetus for the nuclear ban treaty is right and that we want to diminish these nuclear weapons in the world. But by doing it through the structure of this particular treaty, allowing um, a, a continued divide between the haves and the have not, so only nuclear weapon states have to adhere to the additional protocol standard, whereas non-nuclear weapon states don't have to adhere to the same verification and, and insight standards, um, continues this uh, trust divide, quite frankly. If you don't have an even standard for everyone, as we saw in the NPT, and as we will see in the TPNW, you actually continue this trust 
divide between those that have and those that do not. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mallory. It's very comprehensive. Uh, Glenn, did you want to come in on this? Uh, yeah, I just want to say uh, that uh, um, I, that I think, uh, well, as I mentioned before, again, the main thesis I had was that it's like by 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 basing the security structure on on dominance and using thereby arms control uh, through this excessive reliance on deterrence, um, you, you, we often conflate and uh, confuse different objectives. So, for example. Uh, we discussed the Iran and the sanctions against Iran. They served, I think we have to recognize they served two purposes. One, they were meant to uh, force Iran into accepting uh, this nuclear deal, but it was also uh, had a second purpose that was weakening its economy and marginalize it as a regional power in the region, an adversary of the United States. Now, uh, Iran complied with the agreement. And again, I think Trump was very open that uh, his main concern about the Iran deal was that it... Uh, removed sanctions and made Iran very strong. So uh, so if you're going to pursue both these objectives, marginalize it in the region and as well uh, try to uh, have an arms control treaty, it's very difficult to do both. And I think with Iran, uh, it's also very, um, the inability to develop trust is also based on the system we put in place. Uh, what, what kind of arms control do we want? Because uh, this is a uh, reliance on deterrence again. I think we can see that deterring the use of nuclear weapons is very different than deterring the acquisition of nuclear weapons. Because the more Iran is threatened, effectively, the more reason it has to develop its uh, nuclear weapons uh, for defensive purposes. And also, we can therefore ask, what has really been the lesson for Iran? What kind of system are we putting in place? Well, they look towards Iraq and Libya, who abandoned their weapons of mass destruction program, and they were invaded and destroyed. Meanwhile, Pakistan and North Korea, they developed their nuclear weapons, and once they had them, they were safe. So what we've done is now put together a nice incentive system, simply to develop your nuclear weapons in secret. So again, you kind of have to take a step back, I think, and think what, what kind of system uh, we're actually putting in place, uh, uh, what we're actually um, yeah, incentivizing. Thank you very much, uh, Glenn. That's very important, and um, I... Uh, think that we're going to have to think about how exactly does that work, because with North Korea, which was a member and left the NPT uh, and then developed nuclear weapons, and now is practically recognized as a nuclear power, also through the diplomacy that President Trump started. Though I will say, uh, I, uh, I, I did applaud the fact that he actually tried to do something, except of course now it's not been uh, moving along at all. Um, I have another question that I'd like to raise and that comes in from the Q&A box. And it was a very interesting question. And uh, this is uh, basically talking about the multipolarity of the world. I mean, the world is becoming more multi multipolar and technology is advance advancing at such a fast rate it's, it's faster than ever, including artificial intelligence, weapons with dual use uh, nature, which uh, some of you have already mentioned. And uh, therefore the uh, questioner asks and says, we clearly need to think of new ways to increase global security rather than being undermined by these developments. So what do you see as the most effective tools, either the ones that we have or that we need to think about like innovative ones to achieve that? I'm throwing it open to whoever wishes to pick up the gauntlet here. I feel like I'm I'm quickest to the draw, no. so I, I apologize. <laughs> no, no, it's great that you're jumping in. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I personally, I think in the arms control arena, we need to understand who's doing what, right? Attribution and accountability. So we've seen the rise in um, emerging tech capabilities to trace where the cyber attack is coming from, to see better what's happening in space, greater situational awareness in space. Um, we can hopefully use AI in some way to actually discern disinformation and, and fake news stories from real news or real sources. Um, if we can have a, a rapid ability to determine um, attribution of, of sourcing or to have determine some credibility in the, in the info wars, infodemics that we hear about, those kind of emerging technology would actually go towards greater stability in my mind. I think the attribution and accountability element of, of that's needed in the arms control arena to see who's doing what. So you can't have these back and forth arguments. Uh, did Syria actually use chemical weapons when the OPCW and the UN confirmed it multiple times and Russia and Iran and Syria itself saying it didn't. If we could have actual um, uh, support of technology to make that a slam dunk case. I mean, I would argue that it is a slam dunk case, but to have 
technology out there that's um, understandable and accessible to everyone so that their lack of trust from the disinformation, from the infodemics, there's some way to actually um, dissipate that lack of trust through this emerging tech. And I think that we do have the capability, it's, it's still growing, but at some point we'll be able to help those sources of credibility we need to support and hopefully diminish those sources of disinformation from having as great an effect. I think that's a, that's a really great point because very often we see technology as something that's kind of evil and bad, but however, we do very often do not talk about the beneficial uses of technology. And in this case, there's been also quite a bit of work done already on the verification aspect, for example, when it comes to nuclear weapons, et cetera. So I think you're absolutely right, but it could also be you know broadened out to other areas, whether it's uh, in the investigation of the chemical weapons use, et cetera. There's a lot of things. And the other issue that comes up, of course, <clears throat> and that again could be very helpful is now a growing focus on biological weapons, for example, because there's a lot of dual use there. I think there's a great um, vulnerability, I think, of the world because it can be very easily abused. The 1972 Biological Weapons Convention does not have verification. It's been opposed. And again, there's a lot of industry, laboratory, academia in there. So, you know, there, there are many issues that we can actually think about and that we can talk about. But, you know, right now, you know, where are we and how do we go forward is really the question in any of these, in any of these fields. Um, Heinz, Glenn, any comments or do I go to the next question? Heinz, uh, please, yes. Let, let me just um, come back to the, to the BAM treaty. Um, Mallory, the divide between have and have nots have been here before. The, not, the treaty did not create this uh, divide. So the, the treaty is there basically because we had this, uh, we had this um, uh, divide. And in order of trust building, of course, I'm, I know the nuclear weapon states and those states who are allied with the nuclear weapon states, they're not going to be on board of the ban treaty very soon. Let's put it that way. But in order to bridge this gap, the nuclear weapon states have to do something. They have to offer something in order uh, to signal uh, that um, they take it serious, this uh, Article 6. So one possibility would be that they really take seriously what is already in the US security strategy as well, uh, to uh, accept and uh, implement negative security assurances. Uh, that means the promise not to use nuclear weapons against non-nuclear weapon states. But this has to be legal, not just a declaration. So and if it is legal, uh, then the nuclear weapon states would have to sign and ratify all the protocols of the nuclear uh, weapon-free zones, which, which uh, basically are legal and which con contain these negative security assurances. The second thing what they could do, which is more difficult, but slowly, the extended um, deterrence should be replaced by negative security assurances because extended deterrence means the promise to use nuclear weapons if one of the allies is attacked or threatened by attack. Negative security assurances are the promise not to use nuclear weapons uh, in, if they are part of the nuclear weapon free zone or don't have nuclear weapons if they are not nuclear weapon states. So I've written extensively about this. Uh, it goes to very technical details, so I will not discuss this uh, very much uh, right, um, uh, right now. Uh, in terms of uh, verification, verification is not the main stumbling block for arms control agreements. Uh, we do have very good verification system by the comprehensive uh, 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 nuclear ban uh, treaty, but it's still not in force. Uh, we do have very good uh, a verification system in the chemical weapons uh, convention never had been used. There was trust enough this is because because the uh, in, uh, verification uh, systems uh, in in the there, there are basically no verification systems in the in the SOAR treaty and the U.S. supported the SOAR treaty, the treaty of 2003 on the intercontinent. Uh, nuclear uh, weapons. There are very good verification systems in the new START treaty, and still it's in question now. So verification is of, often used as an excuse if you don't want to have uh, 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 an agreement for political reasons. So it's a technical pretense, uh, what I would say. Uh, of course, trust building and confidence building uh, is always very, very important. If, if one say trust and verify, uh, then, but, but verify, I would rather 
turn this argument in, around and say, uh, verify, but trust is more important. Right, but it's like a bit like the chicken and the egg uh, situation, isn't it? I mean, which comes first? So, you know, I'm not quite sure we're going to come to the conundrum of this. Um, I, um, I, I, I must say that, yes, verification provisions are very often in treaties, but they are usually not exercised because of political reasons, because there could be a reciprocity uh, request. And I think that's particularly true, for example, in the Chemical Weapons Convention. Uh, and uh, that's to my mind, very much a concern. I don't know, Glenn, if you have something to come into, but if you don't, I have one more question that I would like to take from the audience, if I may. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, no, I'll just uh, yeah, add quickly on this, uh, the idea of technology. I, I can agree that uh, obviously that the main area it could play in the process of trust and verification would be uh, improving the verification process. But as Heinz pointed out, it's not necessarily uh, the, the most challenging area. Uh, but I would see it... Uh, well, yeah, conventional logic would suggest to, to primarily be uh, create more uncertainty. That is because in the past, when one side had um, uh, conventional superiority or even nuclear superior, superiority, uh, the logic of the other side would then be simply, you know, give uh, more more people access to the button. I think there will be a new security dilemma emerging now as we increasingly learn to automate weapons. Because when you automate weapons, uh, it comes with a risk, that of an accidental war. However, when a state is, is pushed uh, by a more powerful state and has to balance it, I think the willingness to automate uh, more dangerous weapons uh, will come in play. So, for example, I discussed before uh, missile defense. I think, obviously, Russia has to, is now developing hypersonic missiles in order to uh, overcome uh, NATO's missile defense. However, we also have other means, such as... Uh, uh, nuclear armed submarine drones, which you can lay at the seabed and just, uh, if the Americans attack, submerge and uh, yeah, set off uh, the nuclear blast. So you do have all these other alternatives, but in it, you're going to have uh, often less control. There's going to be greater opportunity for accidental war if you don't control the technology properly yet. So I think that's the, that, that, that's the dangerous part of having um, too skewed balance of power as it is, uh, as automation begins to roll out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Glenn. That's uh, that's uh, really, you know, very good. But it's the technology, I think, will be with us for a long time and will be even developing. And we need to find a response to that. And that's something that uh, I think is not sufficiently being done. Um, now, there is a question uh, from a doctoral student at the University of Vienna. Uh, and uh, he this question is directed specifically to you, Glenn. And uh, this comes back to the uh, uh, OSCE that we've talked about, which, of course, right now is also in a big crisis of confidence. But she is asking whether uh, you regard the OSCE as an institution Russia would make use of for politically influencing the West, for rebuilding confidence, and even putting forward nuclear arms control and, and uh, disarmament agreements. Can I turn that over to you, since it was addressed specifically to you? Sure. Uh the, the OSC, right? Uh, yeah, well, uh, well obviously, uh, since the early 1990s, Russia had put its hopes on the OSCE developing as a security institution. The hope was that NATO would begin to disband, or if it's going to remain, at least include Russia. But uh, the main hope was pinned on the OSCE. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, that hasn't really worked out as it has diminished uh, in force over time. But but essentially, that, that would tick a lot of the boxes which Russia is uh, after. That is, uh, it would have a seat at the table uh, and, uh, again, an inclusive institutions uh, institution where it would also have the ability to uh, influence decision-making, but also to the extent it can put a check on the West. So I, I would uh, definitely argue that uh, Russia has a lot of uh, interest in developing the OSCE as a security institution. I mean, this has been largely the project, uh, you mentioned Helsinki before, ever since Helsinki began to push for the idea of a non-divided Europe. Uh, this was Gorbachev's idea, this was what Yeltsin wanted to join the West. Also under the Putin administration, they've been uh, pushing for this, uh, you know, for a new uh, security architecture with Europe, uh, EU-Russian Union, and uh, well, a lot of different initiatives for this Greater Europe project, uh, which, um, well, in my opinion, died in 2014, and now they're looking more towards greater Eurasia. But, uh, uh, but definitely, I think OSCE would, uh, uh, of all the alternatives, I think that would be the, 
ideal institution to develop uh, some arms control and, uh, well, again, to try to empower this institution. Thank you very much, uh, Glenn. And um, let me move now to something else. I mean, of course, it comes back to also things that uh, that all of you have, have talked about. And that is we have the uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference coming up. Uh, I will share with you just this afternoon, I had an earlier meeting and I learned <clears throat> that actually the decision whether it's going to be held in January, which I think is very unfortunate timing because of the possible turnover or continuation after the elections in the United States uh, would happen then. But on the other hand, what um, is really important is to see what is actually going to be the stance. We talked already about the, two, the new norm that was going to be established uh, by the Treaty on the Provision of Nuclear Weapons. And uh, so the question is really, what is going to happen there? I uh, think that uh, Heinz made also very good points about the uh, nuclear, the negative security assurances, which is low hanging fruit in essence. I mean, that really should be something that the non-nuclear weapon states should have demanded uh, by giving their uh, contributions and participation in the NPT. But the question is now that we have the situation, lack of trust, uh, arms control treaties that have been abrogated, uh, others that are in abeyance, uh, no new initiatives that are being started. So what do we really expect from the uh, from the NPT conference, review conference, which was supposed to be a celebratory moment of 50 years, but now I think is very, very much slipping into uh, like, let's see if we can hold it together um, uh, effort. And that is, uh, to my mind, something that we really need to be very concerned about. And if you don't mind, maybe I'll go in reverse order and call on Heinz first. Heinz. Yeah, uh, thank you. Of course, there's a debate about uh, should the review conference be uh, a success? And then lots of compromises should have uh, will have to be made or sh should uh, the nuclear non-nuclear weapon states stick to their positions and then probably we will have a, a failure of the uh, review conference as well. Um, uh, so, I, I know that divided opinions of those and diplomats really would like to have a success of the roof conference and uh, uh, actionists uh, would like to have um, uh, that uh, 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 abolishment of nuclear weapons is a high priority and there should not be made too many uh, too many conferences uh, uh, compromises. Um, low hanging fruits, you can concentrate on this negative security insurances, but then you have the high hanging fruits like the nuclear weapon free zone Middle East or, uh, uh, or the, the, the ban treaty. Uh, so, to, to, my, to, to my mind, uh, compromises have been made a lot in the past, and the Article 6 has not been implemented. I just want to remind you. Uh, that the that MPT was concluded at the beginning uh, only for 25 uh, years, and after 25 years, Article 6 should have been implemented uh, already. That was the intention, and the non-nuclear weapon states would have not would not have been uh, agreed uh, 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 to the MPT treaty if you hadn't had the Article 6 um, uh, agreement. Now we have this debate: why whether the MPT. Uh, should have been extended indefinitely or, or not. So uh, to my mind, it's not very a um, uh, real issue because whether you have another only limited 25 years and the nuclear weapon states will not imp implement it either, or you have an indefinite uh, treaty and the nuclear weapon states don't, uh, uh, don't uh, implement Article 6 uh, or neither. So we have, uh, that's, that really is not the, met, the, the issue. The issue is whether the nuclear weapon states really uh, meet their uh, commitments. And they have to show something in order to build trust with the non-nuclear weapon states, or there will be a failure of the, non, uh, of the uh, review conference. So I, I do think the move is on the side of the nuclear weapon states now to do something, otherwise, Otherwise, uh, another compromise will be another uh, extension of the issue. And uh, if the, uh, the, the, the ban treaty will enter into force with three ratification pendings, uh, it will be a major issue in the, in the review conference. And I don't think that the nuclear weapon states will uh, just 
uh, accept the status quo situation as it was uh, since '95. Uh, so, so I, I question is a failure or uh, compromises by the nuclear weapon states. So, I would support the, that, to say that the nuclear weapon states would have to uh, show some willingness uh, to uh, uh, offer a non-nuclear weapon state something low-hanging or a little bit higher-hanging fruit. Thank you very much, Heinz. Uh, I uh, was just alerted Mallory has to leave very soon. So if you don't mind, Glenn, I'll ask her first to say a couple of words, and then if she has to leave, we understand, and then we will close up. Mallory, please. Sorry, I keep I seem to keep cutting Glenn off. I um I I agree with Heinz that there needs to be some um, movement in the NPT context from the nuclear weapon states, and I certainly understand uh, the impetus for the nuclear ban treaty by those countries that have felt that they have gotten nothing, um, you know, since the promises of Article Six. And I and I I think that's something that has to be worked upon um, because it is an agreement that is so important um, for. Um, keeping sort of a non-proliferation and arms control structure in place um, in the nuclear arena. Now, does that mean we can't we can't move forward and actually do better than 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 the NPT? I mean, we keep the NPT and hopefully achieve more. And and as the TPNW, the Nuclear Ban Treaty, is pushing for, try to um, gain more ground. I, I guess just it's it's a concern to me that we push too much um, toward a TPNW that that. You know, I don't want to throw out the TPNW because it has this um, uh, continual uh, double standard of, of verification. But I think we do need to start with a collective step forward where we're all on the same ground for verification and insight. And I think the nuclear weapon states should be part of that conversation. Um, you know, the the attitude of, of avoiding the negotiations of the TPNW and thinking that um, they'll just go away is not is not a productive attitude. And, and I don't think it's been successful. Um, especially not if the TPNW comes into force. Um, so, you know, I, I don't have the answers, of course, but I think at least some engagement, some way to demonstrate certainly that the nuclear weapon states have done um, a lot and they and they are willing to do more, but they have to be realistic and approach it as, a, as an equal partner at the table. So there isn't a hierarchy between the haves and the have-nots, but actually sit down together as equal partners to try to push this conversation forward, uh, releasing some of the anxiety and disgruntlement from, you know, years of inaction and, and hopefully um, find even, even um, uh, you know, even low hanging fruit that can collectively uh, keep the conversation going and support the NPT as a whole. So nothing new, but an agreement with Heinz on that. Well, ex excellent. Very, very good. Thank you very much. I mean, that was terrific. And if you do have to step out, then uh, please, I wanted to thank you most warmly for being here and sharing your views and your insights. And um, that was really great. Uh, and we thank you very much. So here thank we you are. so but much for having me. And thank you to my panelists. Thank you, Angela. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Glenn, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> no one wants to cut you off. But anyway, you know, here you are. And basically, I should say, you have the last word. Now, that's already something, isn't it? Okay, thank you. I'll just uh, very quickly make a, one final comment on the OSCE and before addressing the NPT. I'll just point out that in terms of inclusive institutions setting the foundations for a security architecture arms control, uh, I think it's worth noting that in the end of the 1990s at the OSCE uh, summit in Istanbul, uh, Russia did uh, commit itself to pulling its peacekeepers out of both Moldova and Georgia and uh, again, the, the logic was uh, what happened afterwards when NATO began to expand and with its military interventionism in the Western Balkans, uh, the, uh, the, lo the, the logic in Russia was effectively, well, if we leave, uh, what's going to happen? It's not going to be a common OSCE replacing us. It's going to be NATO troops marching east towards Russian borders that will replace us and replace the peacekeeping. So what did they do? They dug in their heels and that's still where we are today. Uh, in regards to the NPT though, I... I, I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think it's a, a good idea to to uh, try to look for small victories in order to yeah, get the ball rolling. Uh, and obviously, one can have sympathies for those uh, non-nuclear weapon states who argue that this is yeah, shaping a nuclear apartheid, where nuclear weapon states will keep their weapons, increase the amount of weapons, uh, or even modernize them, as you know, the U.S. is now uh, modernizing them to make nuclear weapons more usable. 
Uh, meanwhile, the nuclear weapon states get to police the non-nuclear weapon states to ensure that they abide by the agreement. So uh, we often see, uh, for this reason, uh, yeah, that the nuclear weapon states often are among the worst offenders. But, uh, but again, uh, not to pick on NATO again, but the, but the U.S. has now yeah, uh, stationed nuclear weapons all across Europe in the new NATO nuclear sharing program. And this is, uh, in my opinion, a violation of both Article 1 and Article 2 of the NPT. So you really uh, need to get beyond this uh, position where you always elevate alliance uh, solidarity uh, above real multilateralism and arms control. Uh, but that being said, I think the, the main challenge ahead is putting actually incentives in place for n nuclear weapon states to well do what they uh, ask of the non-nuclear weapon states, that is to abide by the NPT. And I guess that's where I would see the main challenge. I don't see where, where the incentive would be to forego uh, these weapons, which give them such a privileged position in the international system. Well, clearly the nuclear weapons have become an entitlement now. I think by the time the NPT treaty was uh, negotiated, uh, you were still in the 60s. I think it started in 68. And uh, I remember China only got nuclear weapons in 1964. So it was still a fairly new uh, development. But anyway, I uh, wanted to thank you. This was really a fantastic experience. I really enjoyed all of the input that you had and all of the knowledge that you shared and also your patience in answering the questions. I thought it was really important to shed a light on some of these issues, whether it's the US, it's the Russian Federation, it's Iran, it's the Middle East. I mean, we have a lot of issues to discuss. And um, I want to uh, point out again that this is the first in a series of, um, of uh, seminars or webinars uh, that we're having uh, on the uh, multilateralism on the world, on the US. <clears throat> so in the next uh, four weeks, uh, you will see uh, three more events on this nature. So all of those who are listening today, uh, I, we invite you to come back and particularly to uh, Glenn Deason and Heinz Gärtner. Thank you very, very much. And Heinz particularly, who was the the, the driver behind all of this and the arranger. Thank you very much for doing this. It's really been a great experience. Thank you and good night. Thank you, thank you Angela. Thank you, thank uh, you, thank you, Heinz, and thank you Angela. Mm -hmm.